Trails into Reverie has a lot of playable characters, 51 to be exact, and hearing that number probably sounds daunting. Luckily though, you don't actually need to manage all 51 characters at once, as most of the time you won't even have access to all of them. This is because which characters you can actually use at any given time is based on which main character's route you are currently following, that being Lloyd, Green, or C's routes. Over the course of the next few videos, I will be showcasing the characters available for each route, including those only available in the Reverie Corridor, and offering some build advice for the stronger characters. These won't be full-on in-depth build guides, but they should at least point you in the right direction. Then, I plan to conclude this character showcase series with a video showcasing how each route can take infinite turns in its own separate video, as the old methods that worked in past games no longer work in Reverie. But for now, let's start by taking a look at the characters available on Lloyd's route. Just like with previous entries, Lloyd is a physical attacker with a good mix of both single target and multi-targeting crafts. What sets Lloyd apart from others in his route though are his brave orders, specifically Toughness Shield, and his signature self-buffing craft, Burning Heart. Toughness Shield will decrease the damage your party takes for 6 counts for the low cost of only 1 BP, making it extremely efficient for keeping your party alive. Burning Heart, on the other hand, will increase Lloyd's strength, defense, and speed by a medium amount, remove all status ailments and stat penalties, increase your party's BP by 1, and eventually provide a 15% heal over time once you upgrade it. At only 40 CP, it is a fantastic buff that you will want to make use of often. Now, while Lloyd is a physical attacker, due to the lack of a good tank-type character in Lloyd's route, it is generally recommended to build him as a tank when playing on higher difficulties. His starting Master Quartz, Brave, allows him to heal himself when attacking with normal attacks and crafts, and you do conveniently get access to the Aegis Master Quartz early on in his route, which makes it so that enemies will be more likely to attack him. From there, simply bulk him up with HP, Defense, and Magic Defense Quartz, and you're good to go. Ellie is a magic-oriented unit with crafts that lean towards the support role. Holy Bullet is a nice HP heal that also provides CP to those healed, and Divine Crusade is a line-based magic scaling craft that applies the weak debuff to enemies hit. And finally, her S craft removes all debuffs, revives fallen party members, and fully restores everyone's HP when used. Sadly, her Brave Order, while powerful in that it provides Accelerate, is heavily priced at 5 BP, making its usage hard to justify. Due to her supportive capabilities via her crafts, gearing Ellie to have a decent amount of CP per turn can help ensure she is always ready to provide support through her crafts. And she also works well when paired with other casters, or equipped with the Thor Master Quartz due to her weak debuff increasing the damage that arts do to afflicted enemies and counting as a status ailment itself for the purposes of damage calculations from Thor. Much like Ellie, Teo is also a caster, though a little bit more offense oriented. She has the ability to interrupt and freeze enemies with her crafts, and her S-Craft can reduce enemy magic defense while also dealing large amounts of damage. She does provide some support though with the ability to reduce the strength and defense of a single enemy, as well as dispel any positive buffs an enemy may have. Teo also has a healing craft that provides a nice upfront heal with a heal over time component baked in. This craft can also remove negative status ailments as well. However, the real draw to having Teo in the group comes in the form of her brave order, Ion Shield. While somewhat costly at 4 BP, this Brave Order provides perfect reflect for 4 counts and restores 30 CP to everyone. Even if you aren't planning to actually bring her directly into battle, simply having Teo in reserve to gain access to her Brave Order can often be the difference against tougher enemies when playing on higher difficulties. Randy is a character who is tailor built for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to hit hard and often with his S-Craft. His S-Craft hits all enemies for 4 S plus physical damage, and can be upgraded to 5 S physical damage while also applying a defense down debuff on enemies hit. To help him power out this hard hitting S-Craft as often as possible, he has a very convenient craft in the form of Warcry, which reduces his own HP by 30% for a huge CP gain. When fully upgraded, one use of Warcry will give him enough CP to immediately use his S-Craft. In a sense, effectively using Randy comes down to using his S-Craft, and then using Warcry to get his CP back quickly in order to use his S-Craft again. You can further lean into this playstyle by giving Randy the Chevalier Master Quartz, which will provide him a damage boost based on his lost HP, a boost that with a fully leveled up Master Quartz can be a whopping 175%. Noelle is sadly on the weaker side, but she still can be used effectively with the proper setup. All of her crafts, and even her regular attack, hit in an area, allowing her to easily damage multiple enemies at once. While generally not very useful for boss encounters, her AoE attacks can be very helpful for non-boss encounters. 
load up on quartz that apply status ailments, something that is very easy to do on Noelle thanks to her ornament containing four lines, and she can turn into a machine at crippling enemies with debuffs. Just make sure to remove the Aegis Master Quartz from her and give it to someone else such as Lloyd as soon as possible. While not quite the powerhouse he was in the Crossbell arc, Waji is still plenty strong in Reverie and can be built a number of different ways. As you get access to more Master Quartz, you can actually build Waji in a similar way to his busted S-Craft build from Azure, given that in Reverie his S-Craft is still among the hardest hitting S-Crafts in the game. But a new build he gets access to thanks to his new craft, 7th Shot, allows him to function as a healer while also dishing out respectable damage. 7th Shot is a magic scaling craft that deals damage in a wide area, and then it heals all party members, Waji included, restoring both HP and CP based on the damage dealt. The idea behind a build focusing on 7th Shot would be to boost Waji's magic stat and his crit rating via accessories and quartz so that he can hit hard enough to not only keep the party healed, but also keep his and his party member's CP completely filled. Risha is busted. She hits like an absolute truck, can stay in stealth permanently with ease, and has one of the best brave orders in the game. The key to her kit is her craft Moonlight Butterflies. This craft puts her in stealth for two turns, while also providing a huge boost to her strength and speed, and it only costs 40 CP. Due to this low CP cost, she can easily be geared such that she can maintain 100% uptime on the stealth buff, which, given how stealth works in Reverie, means she is effectively invincible and has a 100% chance to crit. And because of this 100% chance to crit through stealth, she can focus most of her quartz and master quartz into boosting her damage output. The icing on the cake is her Brave Order, Shiranui. This Brave Order reduces the delay of your party by 50% for 6 counts and provides a huge speed buff for 2 turns, all for the low cost of only 2 BP. While this won't allow for infinite turns due to the changes in how delay works, Risha's Brave Order is still in a league of its own. One of the first characters you'll actually get access to on Lloyd's route is Mr. Scarecrow himself, Lecter. However, contrary to his reputation in the series, as a playable character in Reverie at least, he is actually pretty lackluster. His kit revolves around applying status ailments, with one of his crafts actually having a chance to apply one to your own teammates, but in general he's not as good at this job as others like Noelle. One thing he does have going for himself though, which can be pretty decent in the early game, is the ability to function as either a physical damage dealer or a magic damage dealer. His base stats for strength and magic are fairly even, and his self-buffing craft heat up increases both his strength and ATS, so he can fill either role until you get better characters to replace him. Much like when she appeared in the Cold Steel arc, Tita will be piloting her orbital gear once again in battle, and with it comes a hefty boost in most of her stats. Tita has a lot of good crafts at her disposal as well, with hard-hitting physical attacks that can delay and a very potent 60% HP heal that removes any status ailments on your party and also provides 30 CP to the healed targets. However, Tita has one major weakness, a weakness that if you play on higher difficulties can be crippling, and in the case of playing on the Abyss difficulty essentially makes her completely useless. That is, her lack of speed. Tita has the lowest base speed in the game, so low that you can't make up for it even if you equip her with every speed boosting item you can, causing her to be a liability at best. To really put it into perspective, I did bring her in against a boss fight on the Abyss difficulty, and for about 45 turns, Tita did not get to take a single action. If Tita is in the game, then you know Agat would be in the game too. And in terms of how you want to play and gear Agat, he is essentially a carbon copy of Randy. The main difference between the two comes down to really one thing, and that is their self-buffing craft. Agatz lowers his HP by 10% more than Randy's, buffs his strength stat, and provides ADCP when used. In contrast, Randy's can eventually be upgraded to provide 100 CP, whereas Agatz cannot be upgraded at all. Overall though, it is kind of a wash which one you choose to use when given the chance to use both, so just pick whoever you like more and go with them. Arisa is very similar to how she was in the Gold Steel series. With a mix of both physical and magic scaling crafts, the ability to interrupt enemy arts, and of course a healing craft that heals HP and restores CP to those hit. She can also summon her orbital gear in battle if you so desire, but in general playing her as a support caster is the way to go. Arisa also happens to have a fairly useful Brave Order and Golden Scheme, which heals HP and EP by 25%, and then for 6 counts, increases the amount of break damage that your party deals by 200%. Wherever Arisa goes, you can be sure that there is a chance that Sharon will follow, and that is the case with Reverie. Unfortunately, Sharon still hasn't recovered from her nerfs that she received after Cold Steel 2, making her a character with powerful crafts that are just a tad bit expensive to use. 
She does have some innate dodge though, and a slightly longer reach than most characters with her regular attacks, so you can opt to make her into a makeshift dodge tank, but your mileage may vary. Much like with Arisa, Machias is very similar to how he was in the Cold Steel series, specifically the second half of the Cold Steel series. His auto attacks are AoE, so he can do the same thing that Noel can by applying a lot of status ailments to enemies, only to a lesser extent due to his orbment only having two lines, severely limiting how many status ailment quartz he can actually equip. Where Machias shines the most is with his craft burst drive, providing accelerate and a 20% EP heal to all targets other than himself within its targeting reticle. Enabling your team to act twice through Accelerate, especially when it comes from a craft, is a very powerful effect, and at 60 CP, while expensive, the cost isn't too prohibitive. The only real difficult part with Machias is making sure that he's slower than your party so he acts last, but not too slow that his turn order never comes back around. Toa makes a return to being a playable character and brings with her a nice supporting kit. She has the ability to apply the weak debuff to enemies, improving the magic damage of both herself and her allies against afflicted targets and she can even throw out a nice 25% HP and EP heal in a large area for only 50 CP, an ability that does get upgraded to also provide 25 CP as well. Her Brave Order, Kokonoi Jean, is a heavy cost at 5 BP, but provides 12 counts of 80% damage reduction and heals the entire party for 50% HP, making it one of the best defensive options outside of full immunities. Small aside, I chose to use the Japanese name for Toa's Brave Order here since it will almost certainly get removed in localization. But Kokonoi Jin or Kokonoi Formation is a nice reference to Toa from Tokyo Xanadu. Hopefully they don't remove this reference, but in case they do, now you know. Nearing the end of all the characters available on Lloyd's route, we have Estelle. A far cry from the protagonist she once was in the Sky series, Estelle's kit is very barren, with only two crafts and an S-craft. That being said, Estelle is still one of the more valuable members to have in your party, at least in reserve to bring in at a moment's notice. This is because Estelle is the queen of breaking enemies. Her barrage craft only costs 40 CP and has an impressive SS break rating, and her S craft when fully maxed out deals 5 S plus damage with an S plus break rating and an innate 50% chance to critically strike. This makes Estelle's S craft unique with its high break rating as most hover around the D break rating. The caveat though is that both of these attacks are only single target. Because of this, it's generally best to gear Estelle with a bunch of break quartz and enough other quartz to get her to a 50% crit rate, guaranteeing a 100% crit rate on her S craft, and then to bring her in against a boss enemy solely to use her S craft and break it instantly. Finally, to round out Lloyd's route, we have Yoshua, another character who is sadly a far cry from his prime. Honestly, the only real thing that Yoshua has going for him in Reverie is his craft Black Fog, which puts him into stealth for two turns, guaranteeing that he critically strikes with all of his attacks. The unfortunate part though is that Black Fog costs 80 CP to use, a prohibitively high cost that makes him the most inefficient stealth user in the game. This is also especially noticeable given that Risha is on the same route as him. Well there you have it, a quick showcase of all the characters you'll gain access to on Lloyd's Route and Trails into Reverie. If you found this video helpful and informative, please be sure to leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Also if you have any questions about this video, Trails into Reverie, or any other game that I cover, feel free to hit me up over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash roslingaming, or my Discord server, both of which are linked in the video description below. Until next time, take care.